There's a question here from Dr. Uh, Bradnia uh, Mahetri, Mahetri. Dr. Sure. Bradnia, please. Um, I have uh, one question is to, I don't do a lot of these, but um, when you try to assess treatment response and compared sizes, do you start, do you like, you had one treatment and one MR and then second treatment, a second MR. For the second MRI, do you compare with the original lesion or do you compare with the residual lesion on the after first treatment to assess percent of the tumor response if you're going to give a percent? Or you, every time you kind of go back to the original lesion and say that, you know, there's a significant response or no? That's a great question. So if I may, repeat the question, do you report only the most recent change, the change to the most recent scan, or do you report the change to the original untreated tumor? And I think there's a role for both. Um, I, by default, compare it to the original tumor in most circumstances. And the preference for our interventional radiologists is to do so. But obviously, because local regional therapies can be applied in successive treatment uh, over successive months, there may be a role for comparing to both the most recent um, post-treatment change and the original untreated tumor. So talk to your referrers and ask them what they prefer. Uh, I think there's a role for both. So in the same token, you had a response and you know you don't have any viable tumor and then you had a follow-up study and now you have a nodular lesion on the side, which you know is like a recurrence. So, and then that gets treated. So again, now when you have that, the second post-treatment, do you compare it to the recurrence or do you go back and uh, say the original lesion was blah, 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 which was treated and recurred and now, you know, where do you compare that for recurrence? Again, I think that the subtleties of comparing it to the recurrent tumor versus the original tumor depends on how your relationship is with your refer. If it's, if, if it's the, the same refer, the same hospital system throughout, I think you can just compare to the most recent scan because they can go back and see, they kind of know where they went. But if there's a mix of different people involved in the care of the patient, um, it may be worth to be more comprehensive and say, compared to the most recent scan, this is the change, and compared to the scan before all of this started, this is what the tumor was. It gives a sense of the magnitude of response and what you're dealing with. So there's no, we haven't um, made official recommendations okay. in terms of reporting beyond what I just showed you but it's something we can definitely expand on in the next version of the manual. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you very much. Okay, we have another question here from Dr. Eid. Uh, he's asking about this smooth curvilinear or linear enhancement pattern. Um, is there a time limit for treatment specific enhancement pattern? He means, he's saying, I mean, a linear enhancement is accepted even after, let's say, one year? That's his question. Yeah, so we've seen it definitely up to one year. Uh, beyond that, it tends to start to disappear. I don't have an exact cutoff or percentage to report to you, but it can persist for, for, for definitely less, more than six months. So as long as it's a very, very thin rim, I let it go. But as soon as it becomes a little bit nodular, I raise the suspicion for, for disease. And if you're really on the fence, that's where equivocal comes in. And again, the magnitude of the lesion um, that you're equivocating on is what should determine the, the next steps. If, if, the, if you're on the fence for a two millimeter lesion, it doesn't really matter. But if you're on the fence for a four, four centimeter lesion, Maybe another imaging modality, if you're going from CT to MR, for example, is something to consider. Okay, great. Um, so a question, another question from Turkey. Turkey, do you want to give the question, please? Yes. Uh, uh, what is the preferred time interval between the 
treatment and re-imaging the patient. So the question was, what is the preferred imaging interval uh, between treatments and post-treatment? And we've made some comments on that in the manual, which I'll refer you to because I haven't quite memorized it, even though I was deeply involved in it. But generally, most people agree that one month after treatment, local regional therapy, and then about every two to three months after that. It also depends on you know, the country, the health system that you're part of, the reimbursements, um, and other, other guidelines that are maybe present in your country. So we tried to make general recommendations if we realized that there may be constraints beyond your uh, power to, to, to say exactly when to do the imaging. Okay, great. Uh, okay. Um, there is a question that I'm not, I, I'm not quite sure uh, I understand it. It's like, can you assess treatment response on CT images? I mean, I, I'm yeah. not, I don't quite understand. Can yes, you assess I, treatment I response it, on CT images? Hmm? I didn't say it explicitly. Um, and it's, again, we refer you to the core manual. We recommend CT MRI with contrast. We, for MRI, right. either um, extracellular agents or hepatobiliary agents are both acceptable. And uh, the emerging evidence I showed earlier had to do with gallium UV DTPA, arguing for the use of um, transitional phase washout, which is, would be a new concept uh, that needs further validation. But that's something that could definitely come into play in future versions of the treatment response algorithm. Uh, okay, uh, you know, Sandeep, uh, the one who asked this question, if you have, if you want to uh, clarify, please do. Uh, hello. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask you uh, in a scenario of post trans arterial chemoembolization uh, in an HCC in a serotic liver. Can you use CT angiography or a triple phase CT to assess the tumor, uh, the response? Because sometimes it does get difficult, especially with CT and when lipidol has been used in a transanterial chemoembolization setting. Oh, very good question. So the concept here is that because you use lipidol with transarterial chemoembolization, that may mask the enhancement. So there's no question that using lipidol will make assessing the enhancement on arterial phase more challenging. And there's, there's considerable debate as to whether or not you can use that alone, the amount of lipidol uptake to say that there is non-viable disease. And I'm, I think it's beyond the scope of my knowledge to say whether or not that's the right thing to do or not. But the Lyra's Human Response Working Group at this time suggest to use MRI instead for those patients. And with subtraction imaging and lipidol being invisible, you have an advantage using MRI over CT or TAE specifically. Right. And another small comment that, uh, do you think there is a role of uh, using FDG PET as well, adding on to the MR uh, or a CT in uh, assessing tumor response, especially in cases where the primary lesion had a, t a tumor in vein at presentation and a local regional radiotherapy has been given to reduce the, uh, to, uh, to reduce the tumor bulk um, in such a scenario because there are a lot of work that is being done on SBRT also uh, without taste, without tear, just focus radiation to the portal vein tumor thrombus, including the tumor bed. So in that scenario, does um, uh, LIRAD's tumor response, does, does this help? So LIRAD's tumor response is really focused on HCC and the vast majority of HCC are not that FDG avid. So I would not recommend FDG PET. Okay. Certain fraction of tumors may be FDG avid. Cholangiocarcinoma is often FDG avid and that may yes. play a role, although we haven't made any comments on that in the uh, tumor response algorithm. Um, in terms of FBRT, the challenges are well known, and uh, Dr. Mandri Olala, who will be speaking tomorrow, will have a lot more to share on that topic specifically. All right. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Singh, um, do you want to give the question? 
Somish Singh. So, so let me read the question. When should these scans be performed after treatment, like post ablation or post taste? Uh, is it the Good same question, question like uh, the intervals? Yeah, so assuming I heard that correctly, I think, you know, in general, we recommend at one month post treatment and then every two to three months after that. And again, I'll defer to right. the core manual where we, where we um, outline some general recommendations for imaging intervals. So we have a question from Dr. Canella. Buonasera, Dr. Canella from Italy. You want to give the question, please, Dr. Roberto Canella? Yes, buonasera. Uh, my question is if uh, there will be future LIRAD version for the CUS contrast ultrasound that will assess the tumor response criteria. That's a great question. So the question I think was whether or not there'll be criteria based on contrast enhanced ultrasound. There's definitely evidence um, that one can use contrast enhanced ultrasound for single lesion evaluation um, after treatment. Uh, we, the members of tumor response working group has limited experience with that. And we're looking forward to getting more experience and learning more from the literature. But I think that there, there will be a role for expanding the tumor response algorithm to include contrast enhanced ultrasound in the future. And um, I know that being in the US, we're, we're biased. We have historically had a bias against using that tool, but it's changing. Um, so please email me your contact um, and share with us your experience and um, perhaps even apply to join the tumor response working group and we can consider uh, yours or other people's candidacy because it's something that we'll need to incorporate in the future. Richard, okay, uh, this is so um, I'm sorry, this is Claude. May I just say something? Of course. Uh, yeah. Uh, so first of all, uh, yes, I agree with Roberto. Very excellent question, so thank you. But please uh, be aware that there is, in addition to the treatment response working group within LIRADS, there is also a contrast enhanced ultrasound working group. Initially, that working group focused on diagnosis, but they are now um, shifting gears and developing uh, a treatment response uh, algorithm for contrast enhanced ultrasound. So Richard and Michelle, uh, the leaders of the contrast enhanced ultrasound working group will probably be reaching out to you soon. Um, but um, suffice it to say that they are in fact working on that. And I'm optimistic that within, you know, some time, uh, maybe within a year or two, uh, there may be a preliminary contrast enhanced ultrasound algorithm for treatment response. Fantastic. Okay, um, I don't see any further question. We still have a few minutes if anyone wants to give a question. Victoria, you were about to say something and I cut you, I'm sorry. I apologize. Please don't take it personal and say what you want to say. Victoria? Oh, I, I never take anything personal that you say. But no, um, I just wanted to get the ball rolling, but. It, it rolled without me, so it's fine. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, uh, now Richard, uh, we're doing some, uh, and we have uh, just a recent paper accepted about automated uh, volumetric resist um, compared to modifier resist, which actually has proved uh, to be um, an efficient tool for evaluation of treatment response. Uh, do you have any um, experience with that, with volumetric resist, uh, or like making it automated and and uh, its utility and its role in evaluation of treatment response? Are you talking about HCC specifically? Yes. Yeah, so no, we don't have any experience with uh, automated tools. I think that it makes sense because recess, if you use only a dimension, really underestimates the change, right? It takes a big change in volume to have a small change in one dimension. And so using volumetric recess can 
be a substitute for one-dimensional um, modified resists. And ultimately, these tumors do shrink. You know, they lose enhancement first, and, but it, and then they shrink. Or they shrink just enough that a volumetric assessment can, can recognize it rather than a single dimension. So uh, bravo, if you're heading that direction, I think that's a great idea. Okay, great. We still have one minute if anyone wants to ask a question. Okay, uh, so Richard, I think that was a very, very uh, nice session. It was great. It was short and sweet and has a lot of uh, very uh, useful questions. I enjoyed the lecture a lot and again, appreciate your support. Appreciate your coming today to give this lecture and uh, I apologize again for any technical inconvenience that has happened, but uh, luckily we uh, it was handled and uh, uh, all our participants attended and the links for the rest of the week, I'll make sure that it, it's reached everyone today. Um, and also um, assuring you guys, uh, please assure your colleagues who were not able to attend today that the lecture is recorded and will be uploaded to the web. And um, with that, I end the session and thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you to, uh, tomorrow with Dr. Lala, what's her name, Dr. Uh, Richard? Do many of us struggle with the last name? Mandarita Lala. Michelle? Mandarata. Mandarita. It's Mandarata. Mandarata. Man, yeah, Mandarata. Mand that's, that's, that's very easy, Michelle. Mandarata Lala. Okay, it's a good, it's a good practice. Good practice for me tomorrow, but I hope I will not forget it tomorrow. So Mandarata Lala. Lala. Lala, you could just say yeah, Lala. I, I I always say that, I always say that, but I want to give your name the full right, you know, this is your family name, so, uh, you know, something that they have taken a long time in building, I, I would not just summarize it to Lala, Madriata Lala, okay. Okay, Michelle, so I uh, look forward to uh, attending your session tomorrow too, so 